Here are this morning's announcements. Reminder, what was previously known as Table Talk is now being called Midweek Meeting for Small Groups. There will be no meal, however, this time will be for small groups to continue to meet in their assigned classrooms on Wednesday evenings. Plan to join us tomorrow, Monday, October 25th, at Verdict Ridge Golf and Country Club for our annual golf tournament. Registration begins at 9 a.m. and the tournament starts at 11 a.m. All proceeds support local families through Helping Hands Community Service Group. Contact Leslie Matz for more info. Please note that the church office will be closed all day for this event. Calling all men, our men's breakfast is happening this coming Saturday, October 30th from 8 to 10 a.m. in the FLC. Our guest speaker is Rodney Monroe, a retired NBA basketball player. Join us for some free food and fellowship. Please register online if you want to come. All men are invited. Calling all kids. Please join us this Saturday evening, October 30th from 4 to 6 p.m. in the DUMC parking lot for our annual fall festival. Hayrides, inflatables, food, games, and more will be available. This is a free community event, so bring your friends. We are also looking for more contestants to participate in our annual chili cook-off happening during the fall festival. The chili needs to be at the church by 3 p.m., but you do not have to be present to win. Contact Miss Jennifer Ingalls for more info or to sign up. Directly following the fall festival from 6 to 8 p.m. is our youth costume party, where our students will have a blast in the FLC. Dress up as whatever characters, celebrities, and even groups that you want. There will be contests and prizes. On Sunday, October 31st, the New Horizons class will be offering baked goods and other goodies for sale to support their community outreach program. Plan to cruise over to the Cork from 9 a.m. through 12.30 p.m. Your stomach will thank you. It's that time again. Our monthly first Thursday lunch is Thursday, November 4th from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. in the FLC. Dine-in or takeout is available. To order ahead, please call the church office by Monday, November 1st to ensure availability. You are also invited to come and pick chicken on Wednesday, November 3rd at 10 a.m. in the FLC. No experience necessary. Reminder, starting on Sunday, November 7th, is our new worship schedule, which will be as listed on the screen. Please mark your calendars for this change. Also remember to set your clocks back on this day as this is daylight savings time as well. Well, good morning. Good morning. Let's stand, let's sing together, y'all. On this journey, get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas of your strength. My story isn't over, my story's just begun. Fail you won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Fail you won't define me, cause that's what my father does.
doors fling wide, the dead come to life. Love is on the move when the Father's in the room. Miracles, miracles take place. The cynical find faith. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Jericho, Jericho walls are faking. Stronghold now the shame. Welcome this morning. We are so excited to be here on this beautiful day. Whether you're joining us online or in person, we're all here together for the same reason. Worshiping our God and Savior. And let's continue to worship him right now. Jesus on 
the chamber aching, miracle making, powerful name of Jesus. On the body raising, prodigal saving, powerful name of Jesus. Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah, I'm free. Hallelujah, I'm free. Jesus, my Savior, rescued me. Hallelujah, I'm free. Amen, amen. You may be seated at this time. As we enter into a time of offering, we know that we have many, re- many reasons to give back. Our God is so good to us. And there are many ways that we can give, whether you're in person or online. If you are in person, we have drop boxes near the doors. You can drop your offering there. But we also have offer, we also offer options to give through your phone, through our website, many different ways. And just know that when you do give, you give to this wonderful church and all of the opportunities that we have to help our community. Let us continue to give our hearts in worship as we continue to sing. Oh, my. 
washed by the blood and I've been washed by the blood let's continue to lift our voices and sing together my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On oh, Christ is solid, what I stand all the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. On oh, Christ is solid, what I stand all of the ground. Heavenly God, we know that we stand firm on your word, on your promises. God, we know that you want good for us. Thank you for your love and kindness, for being slow to anger. Thank you for knowing us, knowing our hearts. And God, we pray for every single thing that is heavy on our hearts we may not have lifted them but we know that you can see in us the things that burden our souls and God we know that you are capable to go before each and every one of these and just be present in these situations and God we thank you for this beautiful day this time together to worship you Lord, may all of the words that we just sang glorify you and you alone. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Washco, I am your director of discipleship. Uh, many weeks ago when Pastor Steve asked if I would deliver this message, I was absolutely thrilled to do so. He just left out the small little detail that he was going to be absent the whole weekend. So he'll be back coming next week. So this morning we are still in the prodigal son and we are finishing up this story of the prodigal son in the sermon series Lost and Found. It's my belief that today this part of the story which is typically left out when reading is a very vital part of this story so I ask that you please join me in reading Luke 15 verses 25 on it is written now his older son was in the field and when he came and approached the house he heard music and dancing and he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be and he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. 
But he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I have been serving you, and I have never neglected a command of yours. And yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he, the father said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice. For this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So maybe some of you have something that's been priceless that's been handed down to you by your parents, families, or maybe you acquired this item that's priceless. Think about this item. What is it in your household that maybe something that you would, if the house was catching on fire, you would run back in to get this priceless piece of material out? Before this very day that I discovered something that had been lost, I would have told you that I would run back in the house for my wedding ring and my Bible. Uh, mostly because on the Bible, my daughters have been fighting for it, and I still don't know who's won dibs on my Bible, but I'm sure they'll work it out eventually. On this particular day, I discovered something that I thought had been lost. My wife and I, we've been married for over 17 years, and on this one day, it's the only day I can think of in our 17 years where I know I broke her heart. Unintentionally, but I know I devastated her. I could tell by, of course, the look in her eyes. See, I know many of you know our daughter Riley, and we call her our miracle baby. But on this day, we had had our sixth Smith's carriage. And my wife said to me, are you ready to try again? And I told her, I can't do it anymore. I can't name another child for not to come to fruition. And for whatever reason that day, I found myself up in the attic, whether it was maybe because it was the furthest place I can go without ab abandoning her or making it look like I was trying to get away and still stay under the same rooftop. But I call it providential circumstance because on this day, as I said, I found something that I thought was lost. I was in the attic and I saw a memorabilia box. And on top of the memorabilia box, when I looked in it, I found my adoption papers. Now I thought this file had been lost for over 20 years, never really looked for it. My parents gave it to me the day I went off to college. They said, we want, we're cleaning out your part of the attic. We need the space, take your stuff. So they gave me the adoption file, but I never even wanted to look in that file. I figured your parents are the ones who raise you. But for some reason on this very night, I was inspired to look in there. And you would think that my excitement would be looking for who my biological parents are. No, my excitement came from the fact that I found a four page love letter from my dad who wrote to the adoption agency why he wanted to adopt a son. And giving away my age a little bit, you could tell it was written on the onion paper, remember that you could see through, and it was typed by a typewriter, and you could see the typewriter um, corrections on here, and the old faded tape that he had used on this document. And if you knew my dad, and my dad was standing next to me, you would easily tell I was adopted, because my dad was six foot two, 150 pounds. He had dark olive skin because his background nationality was Czechoslovakian. He was an engineer, as, as deep as engineers go, and that just wasn't how I was wired. And so I've never understood what it meant to have, be in the same image of your family, to look like your family, and what that meant. But on this day, when I found this letter and I started reading through this, I realized I didn't have his physical image, but my heart was identical to my dad's heart. I had my wife and my daughters read through this letter, 
and you could tell that these words were my words. That the way I was talking, that he, the way he was talking about how he would love a child is the exact way how I would describe loving a child. And so for the first time, I realized what it was like to be in my dad's image. And so I bring this story up to you to let you know that I'm not the only one with these priceless documents, this priceless letter from God. All of us have the same priceless letters of love from God. And so my question to you is this, one we all struggle with, why are we not reading the priceless letters from our Heavenly Father? What are we missing out on? Rembrandt has a painting regarding this prodigal son. This painting that you see up here was painted by Rembrandt and a pastor and famous author, Henry Nouwen, wrote a book on this painting because he sat in front of this painting every day for a couple hours for two years. This painting was speaking so much to him. And so I, I ask you to consider that painting about the prodigal son. And we know there's a father and we know there's a younger son and we know there's an older brother. And my question to you is, would you be able to pass a 10 question test if I asked you about details of that painting just after looking at it for 10 seconds or so? Would you be able to tell me how many characters are really in that painting? Could you tell me where they're located? Could you tell me what the father is doing, what the younger son is doing and what the older brother is doing? My point is this, let's look at this painting. Notice the details. The father whose face is incredibly illuminated, even his hands are illuminated. One hand looks, is actually feminine, one is actually masculine. And the hands are wrapped around his son whose face is buried into his father's chest. And his son is wearing his torn clothing and, and one, one uh, foot has nothing on it, the other one's a torn sandal. And notice the older brother, his face is slightly illuminated, but his hands are closed off and he's standing on a platform. And then there's an estate planner, there's a servant behind him and believe it or not, there is the mother in, in the top uh, left-hand corner who's looking down upon the whole situation. There's six characters in this. Notice the father's facial expressions. There's so much going on in this painting. And my message to you is this, unless we study this painting, we will miss out on the true details as they are meant to be experienced in this painting. And if we don't study God's love letters to us, how much are we missing out on his details? Will we not miss out on the intimate details of who he is? How do we prevent from tainting God's image of the Father with our own influences, our personal experiences. Perhaps we box him in or mold him into our shape of what we think he should look like. Isn't it possible we're missing out on accurately recognizing his loving gestures to us, his divine influences, his providential circumstances, because we don't know him as well as we could? And isn't it possible we if we study his love letters, we will connect with him more intimately, maybe even be more confident in knowing who he is and his love and sharing him with others. If we studied his love letters to us, will he not seem less of a distant God? Will he not seem less of an invisible God or a too busy for me God? Or I'm not worthy of him, God? or he's just too angry with me kind of God. Any good speaker will tell you they have a message that they, or a pattern that they follow. Tell them, tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them and tell them what you told them. And so I'm gonna just tell you right up front what the message for today is, and that is that God's love and compassion and, are, and mercy are limitless, irregardless of our actions towards him. Now. Let's just not let that blow over our heads or go in one ear and out the other. This statement that his love is limitless regardless of what we do 
should drop us to our knees, should be energizing, should be motivating. Think of the time maybe when you first started dating your spouse or maybe you're dating a boyfriend, a girlfriend, and what that's like, that passion, that pursuit. And when you're, and when you're pursuing them and, and all the emotions are going on, and even if they mess up, even if they do something stupid or hurt your feelings, don't we just easily just brush it to the side and say, I'm going to look past that? Well, that's what our Heavenly Father is doing with us only on a magnitude of high level. I tell my daughters, and they can finish the statement for me. I tell them, there's nothing you can say to make me love you more. There's nothing that you can do to make me love you less. And isn't that what God's message is? See, if this story was simply about the prodigal son, could, it not just, could Jesus not have told this story just with the father and the young son? Jesus does not waste words. So if he's bringing in a third character, there must be a very important reason. So when Jesus told this story, there was two groups of people he was telling it to. One was the tax collectors and the sinners. And so he brings in this prodigal son, this prodigal son that would speak to the tax collectors and the sinners, where they would go, you know what, I'm lost, but I want to see that father. I want that loving father wrapped around me. I want that kind of love. And so Jesus talks about this prodigal son, hoping that their ears and eyes will be opened and then their second group is the Pharisees, the good people, right? The, the rule followers, the ones who look like they're doing it right, the ones who act like they're doing it right, the ones who talk like they're doing it right from the outside. And so Jesus brings in his older brother, hoping that he will wake them up, these Pharisees, to be, say, I don't want to be like this older brother that from the outside, I look like I'm doing it right. But when you look at his heart, it tells a different story. See, not only did the younger son become lost, but I believe the older brother was equally as lost. Henry Nouwen, I told you, wrote a book on this painting called The Return of the Prodigal Son. He writes, the lostness of the elder son is much harder to find and identify. After all, he did all the right things. He was obedient, dutiful, law-abiding, and hardworking. Outwardly, the elder son was faultless, but when confronted by his father's joy at the return of his younger brother, a dark power erupts in him and boils to the surface. Suddenly, there becomes glaringly visible and resentful, proud, unkind, selfish person, one that had remained deeply hidden, even though it had been growing stronger and more powerful. The older brother was upset because the father gave the younger son a gift in a moment. Yet the older brother had the gift of the father and all that he owned for an entire rest of his lifetime. We would say he's doing the right things. I, could, I can absolutely identify with this older brother and have. I identify with this older brother Regrettably, at an age of six, my, my parents told me this story where they sat me down and my sister, who's two years younger than me, she was also adopted, and they sat us down and told us that they were considering adopting another child. And my sister instantly jumped up and squealed and was filled with excitement that she was going to finally get another little brother or get a brother or sister. And my parents said, without skipping a beat, I looked over at my sister and I looked, said to her, are you crazy before you came along, I had it all. And now we're going to have to split it up three ways? That's the heart of this older brother. Fortunately for the transformation of my heart since then. So I would challenge that both brothers' hearts are similar. Only one brother simply had the guts to take action. Both are self-centered, both not caring about one another, both ignoring the father's feelings and the position of his respect. There is light on both faces in this painting, but the light of the father's face flows through his whole body, especially his hands, and engulfs the younger son in a great halo of illuminated warmth, whereas the light on the elder son is cold and constricted. His figure remains in the dark, and his hands clasped remain in the shadows. So we see this older brother who looks like he's doing it right, sounds like he's doing it right, but clearly his heart reveals it's not right. So 
I'd be uh, doing you harm if I didn't say, well, what's the solution? How do we not become like this older brother? Because I, I believe it's real easy for us. And I think that's why, unfortunately, this is titled the prodigal son. I think if we titled it God's limitless mercy, we would just blow over it because it's all throughout this Bible. And I think from a marketing standpoint, they called it the prodigal son because we would go, yes, I can identify real quick. Yep, I was definitely lost and now I'm saved. And guess what? Now I'm going on with life. But God brings in this older brother for us to wrestle with the fact that he doesn't want us to become at any point in our life like the older brother. See, the solution to not becoming like the older brother is simple, but we have to be intentional. And the solution is to have trust and gratitude, which should be our disciplines for the conversion of us as well as the older brother. I call gratitude being your victory guard, bro. If you wake up every morning and you, the very first thing, think of the three things that you are grateful for, it sets the tone for the rest of the day. And you do that day after day after day, it builds a perspective. We're gonna hit guardrails. God realizes that. He doesn't want us to have to go over the cliff, so he puts up these lovingly, these loving guardrails for us. And we're gonna hit them. But hopefully it's gonna steer us back onto the right path. So not, let's not forget that the main focus of the story, it's not about the prodigal son. It's actually about Jesus showing us how much our father has limitless love for us. We started this whole entire series, the Lost and Found series, because we wanted the whole body of the church to have and share in the same image of God. And I do remember when Pastor Steve asked me, um, you know, what's your image of God? I hesitated. And then I could tell I started projecting and inserting my own thoughts regarding the image of God when it's right here in his love letters. And it's this photo here, it's Jesus. That's the image we should all of, as a church have of God. And the phenomenal news that I think is it does not matter where on this planet you live, what nationality, what gender, what race you are, Jesus is the same individual and he is the same God. And he shows up in ways that we can each individually recognize him as Jesus. He has so many names. He has the name of the way for map makers to know his image. He has the name of cornerstone so that brick masons will know. Alpha and Omega so scientists will know his image. Physicians so that the doctors and nurses will know his image. Morning star so astronomers will know him. Lamb of God so that the farmers will know him. The deliverer so that mailmen will know him. The ancient of days so historians will know who his, he is. So. The servants, so waiters and waitresses know who he is. The horn of salvation, so musicians will know his image. The bread of life, so that bakers know his image. The word, so teachers and professors know his image. The root of David, so that gardeners know his image. The living water, so boat enthusiasts know his image. The mediator, for the peacekeepers. The, the rock, for the geologists. The strong tower, for the ar architects. The truth, for the politicians. Okay, I went too far on that one, didn't I? Jesus should be our image that we all instantly think of when it comes to the image of God. God's love for us is limitless, irregardless of what we say and of what we do. And that to me is incredible and amazing. If today's the first day, maybe through this message that you've come to the realization that how much God loves you and pursues you. And so many of you know that I, I constantly am telling you that you were created on purpose for a purpose and that the purpose of life is to have a life of purpose and that there is no problem, there is no trial that is greater than your purpose. And so I would invite you to come pa speak with Pastor Steve, with myself, with Ben, if you would like to discover or learn more about what it's like, not as a religion, but as the relationship that he is, he is wanting to have with us. We would love to walk by your side. Thanks be to God. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that, man, wow, you just pursue us. The creator of all who 
is our God, and yet we get to call you Father, a living Father who's pursuing us, who's chasing after us, who loves us so much and wants to have an intimate relationship with us. So, Father, I just pray that we come to realize how important that is. And, Lord, that you want to use us for the blessing of others, for them to know this. Lord, help us to remember it's not about being good. It's not about doing the right things. It's about a heart transformation. And so, Father, I thank you that you give us these love letters, these priceless love letters, so that we can come to know your image. We can come to know how you speak to us. We can come to know how you show up to us. We can come to know how to recognize you and share you. We ask all of these things in your glorious name, Lord. Amen. Have a wonderful weekend.